Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Belanger, and I'm the manager of library programs and user experience at the Côte St. Luke Public Library. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to a discussion with best-selling author Mega Majumdar. Mega Majumdar was born and raised in Kolkata, India. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, where she was a Traub scholar followed by graduate school in social anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. She works as an associate editor at Catapult and lives in New York City in Brooklyn. A Burning is her first book. Follow her on Twitter at Mega Maj and Instagram at mega.maj. A Burning is an electrifying debut novel about three unforgettable characters who seek to rise to the middle class, to political power, to fame in the movies, and find their lives entangled, entangled in the wake of a catastrophe in contemporary India. So I would like to welcome Mega to the screen and to the event today. Hi and welcome. Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for taking the time out of what I'm sure is your busy schedule to speak oh to my us. God. My about, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. About your thought provoking debut novel, A Burning, and congratulations on its enormous literary success. So, first of all, I'm happy to say that I had the opportunity to read your book over my vacation, which wasn't too long ago and was immensely impressed by your choice of three main characters, Javan, Lovely, and P.T. Sir, in regards to how each brought something different to the narrative and each underwent a transformative journey throughout the course of the book. Could you please tell us more about these characters, how they came about? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Danielle and Angela, and um, thank you everybody who is joining us during this lunchtime. I know that it's a, it's a tough time for, for many of us, and um, I really hope that this short chat about fiction and writing brings you a bit of a break today. Um, so my book, A Burning, is about three characters, like you said, and um, I can really quickly share who they are. Um, so the central character is a young woman called Jeevan who, you know, all she wants is to keep her job at the mall. She wants to rise to the middle class, enjoy her new smartphone, um, but she gets into big trouble because of this politically risky comment that she makes on Facebook. Um, the second character is her neighbor, called Lovely, and Lovely is um, a person who lives at the intersection of various kinds of marginalization. And from that place, she chases this really big dream, which is to um, become a movie star. That's what she wants. She goes to these little amateur acting classes every week. Um, and the third main character is um, referred to in the book as P.T. Sir, just like a gym teacher. Um, and he is Jeevan's former school teacher. Um, and, you know, he is somebody who feels that in his work as a school teacher, he's not really having the kind of vigorous impact on the nation that he might have dreamed of. You know, his students kind of think of him as a joke and they're always trying to make excuses and get out of his class. And so he becomes drawn into the workings of this right wing political party and he has to figure out how far he will go and what kind of sacrifices he'll make in order to secure his grasp on this little bit of political power. Are the characters based on anyone you know? I made them up. <laughs> They're not based on anybody that I know, but I think that, you know, this book is so deeply nourished by journalism um, in the sense that I learned a lot from reading newspaper reports and articles. Um, and it's also really nourished by my observations from having grown up in India and just looking at the kind of intelligence and hustle and humor 
that um, that people move forward with, you know, especially in a place where institutions and systems do not serve you, which, you know, um, I think is, is a common experience for many of us is that we live in societies where the systems that are around us do not work for us. And um, certainly, you know, that's true in the kind of society that I'm writing about as well. So how do you move forward? How do you make things work? At the heart of the novel, I feel is the idea of chasing your dreams, contrasted sharply by what dreams are accessible to whom in today's society. Do you agree? And can you elaborate on this subject? Yeah, um, that is such a perceptive reading. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I do think that, for example, Lovely, who wants to become a movie star, she is somebody who has a very attentive kind of understanding of shame because she lives in a place where she is constantly shamed and told what dreams she can pursue and what she cannot. And I, I think you're right that when I think about what freedom means for these characters, so much of it is about the opportunity to pursue a meaningful life, right? And so what happens when you are denied that opportunity, right? Um, so I think chasing ambitions, and it's also something that um, I think is beyond kind of survival mode in a way. Um, this is a book which is very much about people being let down by systems, but I also wanted to show how people don't just operate in, in survival mode, right? They make jokes and they have humor and you know they visit their friends and they watch TV. And a big part of exceeding those circumstances is holding close to yourself a dream that is big and meaningful to you. Um, something that you really want to achieve, a kind of meaningful life that you want to have. So dreams are a big part of this book for sure. Social media also plays a crucial role in altering the course of Javan's life and ultimate goal of becoming a middle class citizen. Can you tell us why you use social media in this way and why Javan may have been more susceptible to falsely be accused of the terrorist attack? Social media, well, you know, I think part of this book is. Um, I was so interested in looking at narratives and who gets to tell their own story, who has a narrative imposed on them. And that's kind of what happens to this character, Jeevan, who, you know, she's somebody who has a narrative imposed on her by the state because certain elements of her past and certain elements of her you know behavior make her vulnerable to that kind of imposition you know it's easy for the state to say you are this and this and therefore this is the story that makes sense for you so that so resisting that kind of narrative logic one of the few avenues that she has um, i think is something like social media. But at the same time, social media, I think sometimes we might think of it as this terrain of freedom where you can say whatever you want and have fun. But I think people who have vulnerabilities in their, in their real life, those vulnerabilities carry over into that space of the internet. I, I think um, by now we all understand that the internet is not free of, of real politics. And um, so social media is interesting to me in that way, you know, for, for exploring how somebody might try to get their story out, but also exploring how it can unexpectedly be a, a space of punishment. So in the same vein, in the way that sometimes others have a narrative for us, can you talk to us a little bit about further in the novel when Javan's words are in a way turned against her by the journalist. Yeah. Um, so what happens is that you know she she turns to this journalist to to tell her story and ultimately is kind of betrayed by him as well. Um, I won't give away too much of the details, but that's kind of the gist of what happens. 
Um, and in that case, I think I was really interested in how, um, you know, somebody can be let down by, by the police, by the courts, by the justice system. And then what do you do? The only thing, the only recourse you have is to go to the traditional media, is to hope that newspapers take an interest and, and realizing how powerful it can be to have a chance to put forward a story which is countering the state's story. So that's kind of what I wanted to look at. Um. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Thank <laughs> you for okay. your answer. You have a beautiful way with words when it comes to describing the sounds and the scenes of India, both when describing something wonderful or something that's quite the opposite. Can you tell us about your experience growing up in India? Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in India. You know, I finished high school there. And um, I think something that I really wanted to write about in this book is just the visual richness of the places that I grew up in, you know, and just get the texture of the place. For example, you know, you might have a fruit seller who sits at the corner of your street who you have a relationship with. And, you know, sometimes they give you uh, poor quality fruit and sometimes they give you okay fruit. And you have this kind of joking, teasing relationship with them, which is um, exceeding the transaction of buying fruit. Um, or you might get onto a train. Um, I find trains really fascinating. And we used to take trains to travel um, on vacations when I was a kid. And I've always been fascinated by how there's this kind of, um, I mean, none of us is doing much traveling these days. So maybe I'm thinking about this even more, but you know, there's this kind of temporary society which forms on a train, right? Like you're sitting with strangers and then they kind of take out their snacks and you share you know what snacks you brought and you talk about where they're going and where you're going and so that kind of temporary friendship there's a kind of truth to it and i wanted to write about things like that you know so i think the the visual stuff of like many people in a train or this person selling something at the end of your street those visuals are portals, right? They are doorways to, to give a reader a sense of the texture and life of this place. Thank you, Meka. My other question related to this uh, is, did you collaborate with anyone uh, who was in India at the time when writing the book to ensure the accuracy of the different experiences you're portraying? I did not collaborate with anyone. <laughs> I just read the book on my own. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you don't shy away from politics and social injustice in your book. For example, anti-Muslim rhetoric, the issues surrounding class and misogyny are all depicted in a matter of fact manner. How important was it for you to explore the struggles India continues to face today in regards to politics, gender and religious beliefs? Um, I mean, I think that's the heart of the book, right, is thinking about the rise of this kind of extreme nationalism, which in the book I wrote about India, that's, you know, that's the place that I think of as home. And I wanted to write about India, but certainly, you know, in the US and Europe and South America, there are many, many places where people are experiencing the rise of extremist, kind of hatred-filled nationalist fervor. And I wanted to look at how individuals move through that situation um, with, like I said, you know, with, with big dreams, with humor. Um, they are not um, broken by it, you know, just because they face a difficult situation doesn't mean that they kind of give up and focus on surviving it. They always have bigger dreams and bigger things that they want to achieve. So I was very interested in exploring how people do that. And so all of these things that you're talking about, like nationalism and, and hatred and violence, all of these things are very much 
present in this society and they are things that they experience and you know the story is about well how do they overcome these things or in what ways do these experiences um change the course of their lives or how does it influence what the meaning of ambition and success becomes thank you um, why do you think Lovely dreams of becoming a movie star? How does her ambition relate to the instances of disrespect she faces in public, as well as to the ceremonies at which she is welcomed? Hmm, that's an interesting question. You know, Lovely's life is so much about performance. Um, she is someone who is always forced to perform in some way and in part because she occupies this strange place in the society where she is, you know, looked down upon for some things and revered in other, in other ways. And so I think she's always performing, um, She's always performing, you know, this, this figure that others think that she is. And while doing that, she's always holding on to a sense of dignity and a sense of self. And some, sometimes that expresses itself as, you know, jokes and humor and that kind of thing. So I think being somebody who is watched and seen and judged in public um, is very familiar to her. And so I think that that place of being seen, she probably wants to turn it into um, a place of, of, you know, where she wants to be seen, you know, and to be seen in the way that she prefers, um, to be seen with adoration and admiration and to have the kind of, you know, love and, and um, just like, yeah, like I said, adoration that movie stars have, I think in all societies, definitely in India. And, and so I think that makes a very, um, I think that has its own kind of logic for her. But, you know, I don't want to <laughs> over explain things. And I think that readers can probably think about that question. Maybe there are other reasons that she wants to. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Meka. I, I believe each of your characters is highly nuanced, which makes them very interesting in and of itself. Um, now I'll turn to education, which plays an integral role in your book. How is the education system um, important in Jivan's experience? Can you discuss this a little, a little bit? Yeah. Um... So Jivan gets a chance to go to school with the help of a scholarship. Um, and, you know, education school is important in this book because it is important in India. You know, I don't know if there's anybody with connections to India watching this, but it'll be so familiar to them to hear that um, we, like when I was growing up, there was such a huge emphasis on doing well in school. You know, it was really seen as your your way to move forward and your way to move toward the kind of life that you want to have. Um, so doing well in exams and learning to speak English and that kind of thing, it was hugely important to us. That was what we were told to do all the time when, when we were kids. It's just like study and make sure you're you're ready for your exams and things like that. And so you know, Jeevan is someone who is very much within that society as well. And she does see schooling as a way to move forward. But then ultimately she realizes, you know, she, she makes a certain choice, which um, again, I'll let people read and, and, and figure, figure it out. But um, she makes a certain choice because I think of the ways in which um, she has seen institutions let her down so much and crucially she also sees the ways in which you know the people that she loves the most her family are are harmed by by this kind of uncaring society around them thank you for not giving away too much i see um, <laughs> a, a question is coming in already from our audience so i'll put it forward 
It is, uh, this person is currently reading your book and it's asking, how do you feel about writing in all different characters as a first person? Hmm. So two of the characters are in first person and one is in third. And I think, you know, I, I toggled back and forth on, um, you know, the, the perspective. So I wrote pages which were in third and then I came back to first. And ultimately, I think I felt that it was important for the reader to be really close to the bodily experience of, you know, moving through the world um, of joy and suffering of these characters. And first person felt like it allowed me that closeness and that intimacy. Um, and then the, the character who is actually in third person, who's a school teacher, who, you know, becomes involved with the political party. For him, I felt like third person felt right because I wanted the reader to feel close to him and have empathy for his morally questionable choices, uh, but to also have a little bit of skeptical distance, you know, to be able to look at what he's doing and say, well, why is he doing that? And how would I respond in that situation? I did appreciate how you approach this character a little bit differently than Lovely and Javan. And I did have a hard time with one of the scenes. I won't get into it because as you see, some people are just starting to read it. And I'm sure many are trying to get their hands on it because it's on a wait list at our library. Um, but my next question for you would be as an editor, like how did that shape your, your experience writing this book? <laughs> Um, so yeah, so for everybody watching, I work as an editor at a small press called Catapult here in New York. And um, I, I think it's so energizing, you know, um, I get to work with authors whose work I admire. And I get to be so close to their process as they are, you know, restructuring things or thinking about sentence level questions and thinking about, you know, the ambition of their book. Um, so I think being close to that is really energizing and it's also helpful in another way, which is that um, as an editor, you read such a huge volume of manuscripts, you know, I'm reading submissions every week and you, I think, come to be a sharper reader because you have to articulate to yourself and to others what it is that you like in a book um, and what it is that does not speak to you. You know, if you have a criticism of, your, of a certain manuscript, you have to share it, you know, with your colleagues and with other people. And so you have to get really good at questioning um, what what appeals to you and what you don't love as much um, in a book. And that is, I think, so helpful for a writer because it helps me articulate my own goals as I'm writing. Something I personally enjoyed in your writing style was that you used a lot of sounds, like the sounds that things make throughout the book. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this something you spent a little bit of time thinking about or ran this idea um, to different people? Because it, it's, it's a different uh, style of writing than maybe what we're used to. Oh, that's such a cool observation. Um... I think it was just kind of part of bringing this world to life, you know? And also I think I was thinking about certain sounds as they are depicted in my mother tongue, which is Bengali, and they are rendered differently than they would be in English. So for example, I'm just thinking of, you know, like a dog's barking, which in English might be like wolf, um, but in Bengali, we write it as keu keu. So I wrote like G-H-E-U, like that's how you render it. And so I wanted to have that in the book. Thank you. Yes, I, I feel like it definitely adds an extra sort of 
layer or flavor to the book? Uh -huh. <laughs> that is such a cool question. I love it. Um, would you like to share a passage from your book for those who haven't had the chance to read it already? Uh, yeah, for sure. I can, I can do a very short reading. I know that everybody's probably on their lunch, lunch break, so I'll keep it super brief. Um, I can read for just about two minutes if that works. Okay, so I'll, I'll just read from the beginning. You smell like smoke, my mother said to me. So I rubbed an oval of soap in my hair and poured a whole bucket of water on myself before a neighbor complained that I was wasting the morning supply. There was a curfew that day. On the main street, a police jeep would creep by every half hour. Daily wage laborers, compelled to work, would come home with arms raised to show they had no weapons. In bed, my wet hair spread on the pillow. I picked up my new phone, purchased with my own salary, screen guard still attached. On Facebook, there was only one conversation. These terrorists attacked the wrong neighborhood. The night before, I had been at the railway station, no more than a 15 minute walk from my house. I ought to have seen the men who stole up to the open windows and threw flaming torches into the halted train. But all I saw were carriages burning, their doors locked from the outside and dangerously hot. The fire spread to huts bordering the station, smoke filling the chests of those who lived there. More than a hundred people died. The government promised compensation to the families of the dead, which, well, the government promises many things. In a video to the dozen microphones thrust at his chin, the chief minister was saying, let the authorities investigate. Somebody had spliced this comment with a video of policemen scratching their heads. It made me laugh. I admired these strangers on Facebook who said anything they wanted to. They were not afraid of making jokes. Whether it was about the police or the ministers, they had their fun. And wasn't that freedom? I'll stop there. Thank you. Quite a, par a powerful beginning to a novel. And as uh, Margaret Atwood said about your book, it has a catchy title and it has a great cover. So let's hope people keep picking it up whether they heard you discuss it or not. Thank you very much, uh, Mega, for sharing your time with us. And I think what I'll do now is I'll just uh, open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions coming in for us. That sounds great. Okay, I didn't see a question coming in just yet, but it is, uh, it may be because they just haven't read um, your book yet. So I will ask a question. Um, could you discuss the interlude that I was alluding to a little bit earlier of the villagers visit the beef eater, uh, why you chose to write it, um, and how you think people will respond to it? Um, well, first of all, I've, anybody who, who is watching, um, don't be shy about asking a question. And also don't feel like you have to ask a question that is very specific to the book. If there are any writers in the room, I'm happy to answer any general questions about writing and process too. Um, and to your question, um, so there's one passage in the book which has a depiction of violence. And I thought really hard about that because, you know, I didn't want it to be exploitative or gratuitous in some way, but I felt that this is a book that is so much about the rise of um, extremism and this kind of, you know, right-wing thought. and. I didn't want the book to 
you know, after it has spent some time looking at systemic forms of violence um, and forms of discrimination, I didn't want it to shy away from the most ugly face of this, you know? So I felt like it was necessary to have this kind of very compact, um, pretty brief section, which um, nevertheless is, you know, it, it goes to a pretty dark place. And I hope that by that point in the book, a reader understands and has enough context to see where that's coming from and, and to have that feel meaningful, um, yeah, in, in their experience of the book. I feel as though two of the characters, both Lovely and P.T. Sir, have a very important choice to make. They sort of get to a crossroads at some point in the book and they have to go this way or that way. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea for each of those characters? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think they are both characters who want to do the right thing. And I wanted to see how, you know, somebody who is coming from a place of good intentions, I mean, they're, they're quite different as, you know, anybody who picks up the book will see, but I think they do have that in common, that thing of good intentions and wanting to do the right thing. And it goes really wrong um, for both of them in, in very different ways. Um, but I always wanted to write characters who were not flat villains. I don't think it's very interesting to write about this kind of flat sense of evil because you know that's not how people are. Um, people have different facets to them and they have moments of you know rationality and irrationality and moments of you know morally questionable behavior and i wanted to write about all of that and just how even from a place of wanting to do good and help others and support others you can end up doing things which are not at all what you thought you were going to do I have another question about um, stylistically how you chose to approach the book. I won't give away how it starts, the middle and the end, but had you considered flipping um, the beginning with the end? No. <laughs> uh, I think it had to follow this structure. Um, for it to work. I think there are certain revelations that work in the beginning and, you know, certain revelations that, that work in the end, but hopefully they all feel like they belong in their place. Yes, they do. They do. I it was just, <laughs> I was just interested if in the idea of whether uh, you maybe had conceived it in a few different ways and had chosen one way, but I could see exactly why you would have chosen this <laughs> um, way. Thank you. I really Rebecca. like your um, write early questions. Can I ask if in addition to working at the library, you write as well? Oh, I do not. No, I do not. You don't write. <laughs> well, um, I really appreciate your perceptive and, and careful read. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, yeah. to meet with us and to share some more insights about your book, which is wonderful. And I'm excited that uh, our members will have the opportunity to get their hands on it soon if they don't already, because we do own it uh, both in digital and in paper copies. Uh, thank, thank you, you Mega, so and thank you very much to your publisher as well, who made all of this possible. Thank you, Claire. Yes, huge thanks to Claire who set it up so beautifully. And um, thanks to you, Danielle. And thanks to everybody who made time on this Wednesday to join us. I hope if you get to pick up the book, I hope you like it and I hope it speaks to you wherever you are and in you know, whatever kind of community you're in right now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mega. Have a great Bye. rest of your day. You too.